All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome today's hot to um, today's Hopkins Hour online seminar. Um, my name is Nick Aitchison. I'm a pain and rehabilitation physician working at the Metro South Pain Rehabilitation Centre, and um, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has um, made the effort to log in today. Um, hopefully, we've got. Um, an interesting lineup for you. Um, I'd especially like to welcome all um, Hopkins Centre members, partners and collaborators who are joining us today, as um, well as interested members of the wider community who have logged on. Um, so I'd like to start by um, acknowledging the country on which we meet. Um, we are privileged to be meeting virtually here in Mianjin, Brisbane on Aboriginal land, traditionally cared for over millennia by the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. We pay respect to elders and their wisdom and culture, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this was always and always will be Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the ongoing negative health impacts of the disruption dispossession and displacement of First Nations people and the colonial systems that have destroyed and continue to destroy wisdom and culture related to land, songlines and traditional practices. Through collaborative intent, we seek to create the best outcomes possible for First Nations people and all Australians. We also acknowledge the widely varied and deeply experienced cultural backgrounds that are brought from all around the world to this meeting. We pay respect to these traditions in recognition of the wealth that they bring to our community. Um, so I'd like to um, start by just doing a little bit of um, housekeeping. Um, there may be the odd uh, technical difficulty, um, but um, we'll press on through those. We've got some um, We've got some very able help in the background from Hannah and Makala. Um, I would um, suggest that if anyone has questions um, that come up in your minds while you're thinking of them, um, can you please put them in the um, Q&A um, section, the question and answer section up the top, or um, or in the chat function um, if you can't find the Q&A section. So there's no need to wait until the end to log your question. You can just do it as it pops up in your head. And we'll, there'll be an opportunity at the end. We'll have about a quarter of an hour to um, have questions and discussions as we go. Um, so if there are any outstanding questions at the end, then um, uh, we'll, we'll try to get them answered through email if possible. Um, so I'd like to um, start um, with a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll just see if my slide transitions are going to work. Just a minute. All right, thank you, Hannah. I might just get you to advance them as as we go. So um, today's topic is um, around um, personal engagement with meaningful participation um, and also around the identity that we create um, around ourselves. So we have a framework at the um, Pain Rehabilitation um, Centre that we use um, for tackling this kind of thing um, called Imagine, Explore, Experiment, Engage. Um, I, um, I'll give credit to um, our very talented occupational therapist, Mr. Michael Dean, um, who has, um, has been working, working with this um, over the course of a number of years. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. Um, so I'd like to start with a slightly medical bent. Um, uh, Hippocrates was um, an ancient Greek physician, and um, as uh, Bill and Ted would say, some old dead dude. But um, they uh, they talked to a lot of very famous uh, um, people and learnt a lot of things from them. So I'm following Bill and Ted's uh, example here. So Hippocrates said, 
It is the duty of the physician not only to provide what he himself must do, but to enable the patient, the attendants, and the external circumstances to do their part as well. So as, um, as people engaged in health professions, um, it is our responsibility, I think, to look outside just ourselves and um, the patient um, and to the surroundings of that person. So Hippocrates did acknowledge the social and environmental drivers of disease. He also says it is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. Um, and thus he's saying that in order to help people, understanding a person is more important than a disease diagnosis. Um, this is obviously not the case necessarily when someone comes into the emergency department bleeding on the floor or something like that, but um, in many chronic situations, it's much more important to understand the person and their surroundings. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, so from a pain point of view, I, um, I started my journey sort of thinking, oh, maybe I can help this person fix their pain by just looking at what's going on with them. But then I realized it's virtually impossible to separate the patient from the influences and interactions with their surroundings. So, and by surroundings, I mean their social surroundings, the way they're interacting with the people around them, and also their environmental surroundings. And, um, and so it's the action and interaction between those that tends to shape the person. And unless we address these external factors and the patient's interaction with them, then we're unlikely to make any significant impact. And we often ask people to change their habits. We say, you know, this is a bad habit you've got. You should really stop smoking or this is you just need to get out more or whatever. But I know that when I try to change something um, in myself that is, I guess, has been wired in there and um, triggered by multiple environmental things, then I find it very, very, very difficult. And I'm sure um, everybody in the audience has probably had this experience as well. Uh, next slide, please. So what we tend to see with pain um, is that we make this short term gain with a lot of effort, like um, Sisyphus in the background here, another ancient Greek um, person. Well, myth story um, pushing his boulder up the hill with a lot of lot of effort he makes this gain and then after a while the boulder just rolls back down to the bottom of the hill and um, has to start again so i sort of see i see people as moldable we're we're adaptable and we've got neuroplastic brains and spinal cords um, we've got uh, musculoskeletal bodies that adapt to different stimuli and actions and the thing the things that shape our minds and spinal cords and bodies are our environment and the interaction with it. So unless that mould is changed, then we're likely to just fall back into that same shape that we've always been in. So to change a person, you can't say just change a person. You have to say, let's let's look at everything around that person. Let's look at the interactions with that person and um, and see where we can make a difference. And that's that's where we've really found the big gains, um, the transformational gains can be made. That's where Sisyphus gets to the top of the hill and he, he pushes the boulder over the top of the hill and it rolls down the other side and you're in a whole whole new whole new um, area to explore. Um, so next next slide, please, Hannah. So we're in pain, we're um, we're asked to explore this socio-psycho-biomedical approach rather than a biopsychosocial approach. So put the social first um, through many areas of um, pain medicine um, and uh, many areas of chronic medicine uh, um, indeed. And the, the pain, pain curriculum um, specifically states, states the specialty of pain medicine is concerned with the study of pain from a socio-psycho-biomedical perspective. Um, but um, I don't think people are doing this yet. We're paying paying lip service to it. There was a 2022 review of um, 66 articles on low back pain, um, which 
um, showed that biomedical factors were still predominating and psychological factors were um, primarily identified as cognitive and behavioral. So, um, you know, cognitive, uh, the person's thoughts in themselves and the behaviors are things springing from themselves. So it's not acknowledging the influence of the surroundings on a person creating um, creating the person's actions. Um, uh, I think um, interestingly, you know, no text was given to social elements uh, almost, despite this purportedly being the most influential or um, important domain in chronic pain, and I would also argue almost all chronic disease. Uh, next slide, please. So why do we as doctors and um, also as allied health workers tend to ignore the social? Um, and I think, I think doctors especially have a responsibility because of the traditional sort of standing and leadership that is given um, to them in the health context. I think we have a have a responsibility to lead with a um, uh, a social example. So, but doctors get trained in a very different way. So, um, we reduce people to diagnoses so that then we can label them and then treat them as we um, see appropriate to that diagnosis. Um, and Ockham, who was a um, philosopher, um, said plurality should not be posited without necessity. And um, that's a central tenet for doctors and perhaps, ta perhaps taken too far. Because individual stories are unique, there's this unique tapestry of um, all sorts of interweaving stories and experiences. And to be told that your experience is just a diagnosis like someone else is um, is demeaning. Uh, also, doctors believe they have no tools to address the social. Medications and surgery have little effect and we're scared to go there in our consultations. We haven't been trained. We sort of we worry that we're going to unearth some kind of something, um, something that is a bit distasteful or something like that. So, um, and we may feel guilty about our relative privilege to people who are having a really hard time. Also, there's the financial side of things. Uh, we're not reimbursed very well for um, just having um, a conversation and finding out about people. Next slide, please, Sam. So, I say to change your life, you need to change your life. If you want change to happen, you need to change the whole thing. Change needs change needs to happen instead of just you changing something small. Um, so um, people, as I said, have a very limited ability to do this through willpower alone and habit and activity change with environmental cues. So if you change the environmental cues, you're more likely to be able to change, um, you're more likely to be able to change a person's um, actions and interactions. Next slide, please. So what is Imagine, Explore, Experiment, Engage? So first, imagining. You need to be able to dream. Um, like Snoopy and Woodstock here, um, dreaming of ice creams. Um, they, when, when we're trying to change something, we have to try and imagine what that change might look like. And that can be very, very difficult. Um, so we're often trying to get back to a place that we were in the past that was happy, but that door is closed to that. But there are so many other doors that are open if we can just turn around, accept where we are, and look um, look at the other amazing possibilities. So after that, you can explore options to um, fulfill that imagination. So Google, friends, family, and peer support workers are all good sources of finding options. And then you can try it out. And if you like it, engage with it, stick st and stick to it for a while to see, see if it works. So um, that's the kind of framework that we use. Next slide, please. Um, so a very brief case study, we had a 60 year old woman um, who had um, been um, on the DSP since age 35 and had a 10 year history of widespread pain. Um, she tried all sorts of different medications, all sorts of different pain education with um, very little difference. 
The thing that really made a huge difference to her was a social prescribing linkage um, to a community theatre group via Ways to Wellness, which is a Mount Gravatt um, uh, based um, social prescribing um, group. Ways to Wellness um, uh, will interview people and help them find out what they would like to do with their lives and then help to facilitate that. And um, her pain went down from six out of 10 down to one out of 10. Um, her um, depression, anxiety and stress um, went from severe to normal. Her pain catastrophizing went from high to minimal and her pain interference went down from five to one out of 10. So um, she started seeing herself as a budding actress and said, you wouldn't recognize me, I'm feeling so good. And she said, it's like I walked into a crowd I already knew. And like pebble, a pebble in a pond, opportunities involved out of that engagement. She said, I'm well, I haven't had any pain. A huge transformative experience. Um, so that was a really good story um, and one that would not have been able to be achieved with um, medications or um, psychological techniques, I wouldn't have thought. Next um, slide. So today I'd like to um, I'd like to briefly introduce our um, speakers. We've got Suzanne Wright and um, Karen Hanna from the Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Service STEPS program, who are gonna give an overview of the service and ways of engaging people in meaningful activity. And then we've also got um, Tim McCallum, um, who is a peer support worker and singer extraordinaire from Spinal Life Australia, who will give um, insight into the peer support work he does and the importance of meeting people at the stage they're at to help explore directions for change. So I'd like to hand over to Sue and Hannah now from Abios Steps. Thank you, Nick. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sue, and this is um, Karen, who is one of our STEPS peer leaders uh, at the STEPS program. So today I'm going to be talking about connection and meaningful activity and how we do that through the STEPS program. Um, I think Brene Brown puts it perfectly. Basically, as humans, we're hardwired to connect, and that's what gives us our purpose and meaning in our lives. And if we don't, then there's suffering. And I think that's what we see really regularly with throughout the STEPS program is that ability to connect with others. So Hannah, I'll let you go to the next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know, STEPS is part of the Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Service and we fit within the Division of Rehab here at Metro South Health. And um, we're, I guess, a, a slightly unusual in even though we're physically based here in Brisbane we offer a statewide program across the state and we have programs all across which I'll talk about later. So next slide please Hannah. So in terms of steps I um, just want to acknowledge that all the photos that you see are actually of real steps members um, who can basically have consented to us sharing their photos so STEPS started uh, in 2005 as a uh, project that was then headed by the then um, program manager, Arity Kennedy, and we were fully funded um, in 2008 uh, and have been embedded as part of the Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Service since then. So next slide. So what we do is an information and support skills program for adults with acquired brain injury, their family and friends. Uh, we're fully funded by Queensland Health. And as I said, we operate as part of the Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Service. We see adults who have sustained a brain injury through traumatic brain injury or stroke from ages approximately 18 to 65. Next slide. And how and why we do this is that Basically, brain injury is seen as a lifelong, long-term issue. And STEPS was formed, is, I guess, because of the recognition of Abios Rehab Coordinators, that there was, um, I guess, limits to that formal rehab stage. And STEPS was formed to try and create those opportunities beyond formal rehab. It's fairly cost-effective. We run off the smell of an oily rag. Um, and it is really important because it involves not only the person with injury, their family and carers. So that could be paid or unpaid. We use a self-management framework, which is really important, I guess, and there's lots of literature around the um, validity of that from 
uh, a chronic disease framework, but that sort of fits within our framework as well. As I said, we are Queensland wide and the aims is to foster strengths and capacity for our leaders as well as people with brain injury. And we aim to raise awareness about brain injury as well and as mentioned, supported by Metro South and Queensland Health. So how we operate is that we've got sort of several key components and I'll briefly talk about those. So the skills program is a six week program um, that we offer. We also have what we call a network group. Uh, we have um, a leader, a peer professional workforce that we provide leader training to and then we support that, those leaders through um, our networking opportunities. So next slide. As mentioned, we um, the main features are that self-management approach. So getting people to, I guess, think about their own health condition and looking at ways they can help themselves and take control of their own um, health condition. We operate using a peer professional workforce model. Um, so what that basically means is that people with lived experience actually deliver the program and they're partnered with uh, a health or disability service provider in their local area. And the other main sort of um, feature is that sustainable community support. And we embed that through the whole stages of the program. Just also to acknowledge, you can see um, on your screen a poster that we use. And each week of the program is basically um, on the, the stairs. And this is actually a contribution by uh, one of our STEPS members who created that image for us um, and we've sort of basically used that image throughout that whole program. So just want to acknowledge his contributions. Next slide. So how we operate with the six week skills program is a six consecutive weeks over two hours uh, with the sixth week being a local community activity. We um, have user facilitated group um, idea via a workbook and each week we have a different topic and the idea is to discuss and share personal information and looking at the, about restoring and strengthening social and community participation and each individual has an opportunity to contribute to that. We talk about practical exercises and there's opportunities for personal reflection and I guess that idea of that peer professional workforce is really important that People want to hear from people with lived experience, not just health professionals. And as you can see, we've, since 2009, we've been collating a lot of data. So we've had lots of people go through the program. Obviously, in 2020, something like a little problem called the pandemic hit. So obviously, our ability to um, provide a state-based group program was pretty tricky. Um, but we've obviously started to come back from that, which is great. Next slide. The second phase of our program is what we call the network groups. And the aim of those is basically to pr provide those sustainable networks um, over time. It operates as a support group style and members of the group take control of the group and, and basically decide what the group wants to do. Um, it's voluntary and people get to experience and participate in those practical sort of community activities. And as you can see, um, here's some examples of the things that people do. Food is always very popular. At our network groups, we've got um, lots of groups across the state. So about 20, 20 plus groups operational at the moment. Um, so you're obviously covering both regional and southeast Queensland. And most of these groups meet on a monthly basis. Next slide. And this is just to give you an example of the average attendance um, of network groups across the state. Obviously, our biggest concentration is in southeast Queensland, um, and some groups haven't met simply because we don't have leaders to support those groups. Um, or during the pandemic, people took a step back from their role, and we haven't been able to um, stand those groups up again. Next slide. So I guess when I think about social prescribing, um, while STEPS isn't necessarily a social prescribing um, pathway, I guess there's lots of elements that we use within STEPS. And some of the elements, um, I guess, when we think about social prescribing is that connection to non-clinical sources of support. 
And some of those elements are around participation, reducing isolation, um, ongoing learning, being active in the community, using self-management and giving back. And I think that idea of being able to participate, get out and about, and that shift from reliance on health professionals or the medical system where the person takes responsibility for their own health or personal circumstances is a key element of STEPS. Next slide. So some of the things that um, work or, or enable us to, to do this, I guess is the, the central coordination of STEPS by two uh, STEPS program staff, and we're both health professionals, um, and we both have expertise in brain injury, specifically the community rehab phase. Other key components that help us with community participation is that collaboration with the community itself. So that includes people with brain injury, their families, service providers, and that's often done via a community development model and providing ABI education so that we're building capacity um, of those individuals and their understanding of brain injury. Another key component is the peer professional workforce that I mentioned. And this is, a, I guess, a really unique quality of steps where people who have lived experience of brain injury actually deliver the program in partnership with a service provider. And I think this is a real value add of steps. People wanna hear it from people with who've got lived experience from brain injuries, not necessarily from me as a health professional. And I think this provides opportunities for participants to gain work experience um, by volunteering for us as a, as a steps leader like Karen does, and it aims to build their capacity and confidence. In addition, the structure of the program itself aims to build connection and capacity building for individuals using those group reflections and self-management principles. And also just that participation. So people are fed from the skills program, the six week program through to our network group phase, which enables participants to practice the skills they've learnt and engage in community activities, develop a social identity, feel valued, and thereby reducing their social isolation and increasing their confidence to try new things. And I think all of these things enable sustainability of the STEPS program. Next slide. So here are some things that STEPS members have had to say about STEPS. And I think you can see there that it's pre all pretty positive, that it allows people to get out and about. And this is, these are direct quotes from a STEPS group um, just last week. Next slide. So despite all the, the positive things, there's a few barriers to community participation. Um, and I guess the, there's a few that are there. Um, we are two-step staff um, and we operate using a volunteer workforce. So that's often a, a juggle to um, maintain those connections for people who um, live outside um, th those regional or remote areas and we're having to constantly juggle both aim, um, phases of the program, the, the skills program and network groups. Sometimes those individual impairments can also be a barrier where people have their own sort of issues resulting from their brain injury and also um, as part of that their own adjustment to injury and their mental health and that can be a real issue. Uh, for people to get out and about and have that um, participation in the community. Transport's another really practical issue. If people can't come because of a lack of transport, often because people can't drive, that's a real barrier. And we don't provide that, um, I guess, physical uh, assistance with uh, attending a group. Another major issue, obviously, in the last few years has been COVID, trying to maintain uh, a group statewide program over um, over a period of time where we weren't able to connect was very challenging. And one other sort of minor issue uh, is a lack of service provider leaders. So we often have lots of peer leaders um, who want to volunteer for us, but unfortunately lack of service providers can make that pretty tricky. So they're the major sort of barriers. And I'm now going to hand over to Karen, who's one of our wonderful peer leaders, and she'll give you a bit of an idea about some of the things from STEPS and how it's been helpful for her. Thank you, Sue. Um, as we know, whole life outcomes for someone with a brain injury is complicated, complex, overwhelming, and can be wonderful. Karen is my name, and I had a subarachnoid hemorrhage four years ago. 
I had my whole life mapped out and it does not resemble the version I'm living now. So how did I get here? Firstly, I would like you to think about an onion. It took me 47 years to be this onion, a big, round, perfectly layered and perfectly formed onion. Then one day I was rushed into emergency with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. On that day, all the layers of that onion were stripped away and discarded. And I found I was that little white bit that's left in the middle of the onion. So when I think about each of those layers of that onion, they represent to me my personality traits, my dreams of the future, detailed memories of the past, my goals, my career, my personal life, my studies, my sense of independence, the role I played at work, the role I played with friends and family. I was emotionally stable. I had excellent health. I had a positive attitude. I had excessive, excessive optimism. I had good communication skills, a sense of humor, a sense of and being able to help others. I had a true sense of my life purpose, a sense of connection. I was able to multitask at a high level. I was able to think fast, be spontaneous. I had an excessive social network. I had a high health self-esteem. I enjoyed music. I loved to go and discover new things. I was confident. I felt safe. I had ample life resources. I felt strong. And I had a passion to improve myself by 1% each and every day so I could be the best that I could be. On that day four years ago, all of those things were gone in an instant. All of those layers were gone. All of those layers were different. All of those layers would never fit the same again. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful to the emergency and hospital teams for doing what they needed to do to ensure I survived, but I feel like I'm a shadow of what I was. I am the little white bit in the middle of the onion. All those things, all those layers are hard to find when you have to start again. Remember, it took me 47 years to be the first version. I found by connecting with people, speaking and living the same or similar life that I did not choose, I've been able to find some of those things and be able to reinvent some of those layers that have been lost. And it has allowed me to become Karen version 2.0. These things cannot be handed to you by your rehab team. They have to be fostered and nurtured over a long time in a safe and supportive environment. For me, the STEPS skills program, the STEPS network group meetings, the STEPS leader training, and each and every member of STEPS that I've dealt with provided me that. Watching the bravery of each of these STEP members participate in the community has provided me courage to look inside for those one percenters. So for everyone in this Zoom meeting today, when you're talking with your patients this afternoon, tomorrow or next week, you can have confidence to discuss the importance of the STEPS program as part of their journey. So together, let's help these patients find their version of their whole life. Thank you. Sarah. So that's it for us. Um, and now we're gonna hand over to Tim and uh, he'll talk us through his uh, workings in Spinal Life Australia. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Uh, how are you going? Um, Karen, thank you so much for um, sharing that uh, testimony, first and foremost. Um, that's a really important message to hear uh, for all of us. Um, so thank you for being so honest uh, and, uh, and open with your journey. And um, I wish you all the very best in the future um, and look forward to hopefully meeting your Karen and version point two onion in the future. <laughs> um, but just want to say thanks very much, everyone, for allowing me to present today. Um, whilst I'm a representative from Spinal Life Australia, I'll, I'll actually be wearing a few hats today. Um, 
person with a lived experience of being a patient who journeyed through rehabilitation after a diving accident left me with a C4 level spinal cord injury, a consumer of allied health services and medical interventions to assist me to recover and manage my condition that allowed me to reintegrate back into society, a singing conductor and vocal therapist who assists people with respiratory challenges, which led me to become an adjunct researcher through the Griffith Uni and the Hopkins Centre, a vocational specialist who worked many years as a disability employment consultant and now a member of the peer support team at Spinal Life Australia, working alongside people who have spinal cord injuries, their families, friends and communities. So I'm very excited to be able to present on today's theme, giving all the various personal experiences and knowledge gained from my colleagues and mentors over the years. So imagine, explore, experiment and engage. What, what does that look like for us as treating clinicians, researchers and supporter services? Where, where do I start? Um, well, I feel like it is me. It's, it's my story, an example of a person-led mode of therapy and its impact on my participation in rehabilitation and consequent health and well-being. I distinctly remember about six months into my own rehabilitation journey, a moment of complete disconnect with a particular activity that I was conducting with my occupational therapist. We were working through a program to help improve my tenodesis function in a group session format. I remember being wheeled into the treating room and on the table was a whole lot of loose timber and tiles with some clay moulds. The therapist began to explain that we were all going to make a chessboard and pieces utilising our recently learned tenodesis grip skills. I just looked at them and I remember thinking, I don't want to be a champion chess player. In fact, I'm not even remotely interested in chess. C can't I do something that I like? Um, so after an interesting private conversation with my occupational therapist, we stripped this activity right back and tried to imagine what would be a more personalised activity that I could still achieve the same therapeutic and rehabil rehabilitative results that I needed. So we started by asking, who am I? We delved deeper into my personality, character and identity, stripped back some of those onion pieces, as you just heard. And once my therapist discovered that I had a passion in music and arts and wanted a career in that field, we then explored what that looked like, what physical activities and tasks that I had done in the past and what would I like to continue to do in the future that revolved around music? So we wrote a list of pieces of equipment I regularly used at home and at work, and then we sought approval to bring into the rehab unit some sound equipment that I could apply the same Tina Desis grip practices to learn how to use this gear again, like putting cassettes or CDs in the stereo and turning knobs and pushing volume sliders on a sound desk, plugging in and unplugging cords in and out of different types of equipment. While the rest of the Tina Desis group were busy sanding back their pawns, castles, knights and queens, I was busy experimenting with my own sound studio. This was so exciting. And yes, you guessed it, it was so engaging. I couldn't wait until the next session and the next session and the next session. I felt empowered. I felt listened to. And finally, I felt like Tim McCallum, the person, not you are numbered patient 107935. This was a therapeutic mode that was tailored to my passion and interest and ultimately served me well after I finished rehabilitation. In fact, I still use those skills learned uh, that I learned back then today. As for the chessboard sets, yesterday I called a dear friend who I went through rehabilitation with and I asked him if he still had his chessboard and pieces. I think you know where they might have ended up. <laughs> but from then on, I had conversations with all of my treating clinicians and asked them to consider how we could incorporate my love of music into each different type of therapy session. Apparently, I was the first patient to ever have a singing lesson in the staff cafeteria of the hospital where I was guided by a physiotherapist, a respiratory therapist and a professionally trained singing teacher. Talk about specific trade and industry specialist collaboration, right? This is my own personal lived experience of what meaningful activity looks like. And I have been a more physically well-equipped and emotionally satisfied graduate of spinal cord injury recovery and rehabilitation. 
But I feel like I've come full circle now as it's been 23 years since my injury and rehabilitation journey. As mentioned at the beginning of my speech, I'm a vocal conductor and singing therapist for the group of spinal cord injured patients and in the community um, uh, in a group called Singing Chords. And I'm sure most of you have heard me speak about this before, where I teach participants how to develop their respiratory abilities and improve the quality of life through the enhancement of breathing, speech and volume, and throat chest clearing for good physical health. And music plays a big part in their emotional wellbeing too. One of the things though that I'm very conscious of is making sure that the participants have a say in what the program looks like for them. I always ask them what are their goals and what are their expectations for each session. I'll give you an example of how I recently helped a certain participant with a very specific goal and applied today's themes to his program. This particular person had a dream of being able to participate in the Bridge to Brisbane Marathon, a huge feat for anybody with a spinal cord injury. The imagined component was already taken care of because this was his dream, his goal. He knew what the finish line looked like. He just needed help to get there. But one of his biggest challenges though was his constant running out of breath. During his training, he was fatiguing quite quickly due to his impacted respiratory issues related to his spinal cord injury. So together we explored different breathing exercises to help expand his lung capacity through months of subliminal diaphragm and breathing muscle resistance training. Now, what that looks like is this gentleman actually told me that the best time of day for him to practice on the breathing exercises I gave him was at night when he was in bed and he was lying on his back. And so I came up with the idea of, um, which is a, a singing exercise that every teacher, um, singing teacher, uh, applies to their students is you breathe in for five, you hold for five and out for five. But to apply the resistance training as he got better and better at that and we made the time length longer. So instead of five, it was 10 and then on to 15 seconds. Uh, he became really good at that. But then I started to apply other things like adding a book or a weight onto his stomach to apply the resistance training um, to his belly. And in the end, he was able to actually carry five big encyclopedias on his belly while he was lying on his back breathing in. Um, we experimented with various techniques of postural support, abdominal binder support breathing, and even mindfulness to help reach a mental sense of control and power in his breathing. The engaging aspect was pretty much a fait accompli as he was the driver of this collaboration and showcased wonderful motivation and determination. So I'm so proud of what he achieved and honoured that I could play just a small part in his dream and watched on with pride as he stormed over the finish line. See, singing chords isn't always just a fun karaoke session. Sometimes it's helping someone run a marathon through practical, meaningful activities. As a peer support officer with Spinal Life Australia, operating in the Spinal Injuries Unit, I constantly see how the impact of imagining, exploring and experimenting leads to greater engagement and fulfilling experiences in the rehab setting. We already have a people first centred approach to the way we make relationships with patients. The very first thing we try to achieve is a sense of understanding of who a person is. What makes them tick? Who were they 30 seconds prior to their injury? Where are they now? And what would, they, what would they like to do moving forward? This helps us to be able to best care for and assist them. We firmly believe that everyone we see already has an established identity. We don't want to and must not try to change that, but encourage and support them to rediscover or reconnect with who they are and who they want to continue to be. In discussion with my fellow colleagues over the last week, I was uh, comforted to reaffirm that we already live in a framework space of today's theme. Each of us, of which there are four members currently serving in the spinal unit, have completed a personal development coaching course called Thought Patterns for High Performance. And the skills that we've learned through that education gives us the ability to help our patients create mindsets for uh, optimal performance and, and to strive to, for continuous improvement helping unlock their true potential and find purpose in what they do in their rehabilitation. This empowers them to drive their own rehab and take control over the activities they participate in. Some of the really important opportunities for us throughout each year are to expose those in the spinal injuries unit to what is possible in all parts of life. 
Along with a strong collaboration with all clinical teams, in particular the leisure therapy team, we find events and occasions either to take patients to or bring into the unit that allows them to experience either something completely new or activities that they had participated in prior to their injury and are now seeing it from a new perspective. In the past, we have escorted patients to disability expos. We've had modified vehicle demonstrations. We invite guest speakers into the unit to tell their stories and lived experiences. We definitely encourage a lot of typical social interaction and engagement through events like a Melbourne Cup Day, which we're having next week, State of Origin Nights, Poker Nights, showcasing various technology, assistive technology that is now available. There's, there's no denying that the Habitec facility that was part of the occupational department and the new assistive technology centre based at Spinal Life Australia's Healthy Living Centre in Woolloongabba are two of the most engaging and life-changing tools for therapists and us to be able to help people or patients imagine, explore and experiment with equipment that will help them with everyday tasks. We do all these things to help a person who may be struggling to visualise or imagine what is possible after their injury and to explore the outside world of the hospital setting. One of our favourite activities is to journey along with a patient down to the Baranda Shopping Centre for the first time, navigating all the pathways, curbs, crossings in our wheelchairs, finding a cafe or restaurant or going shopping and learning how to carry food or items, how to open wallets, purses or Apple Pay on watches and phones. These opportunities are exactly what meaningful activities and practical social integration looks like. It always, it's always personally driven uh, by the patient and we are merely there to just capture the moment when somebody may ask us, how? And then we engage with them to help them learn. Getting back out into the community or even just a home to complete recovery, like the wonderful hospital to home project, should be a key focus in the way we can care for people. There are mountains of research articles that recommend that the outside world is where recovery and healing is the optimal treatment location. Often in a hospital or rehabilitation setting, you can feel like your life has stopped. You're kind of stuck in it or plateaued in a holding pattern. And then when you're given the opportunity to re-engage with the outside world, you can see that the world has still been ticking along. And people want to be and should be a part of that. Even the ability to access nature, a, a green space that is an all sensory experience, that can inspire a sense of belonging and a reimagining of one's identity. Now, if somebody came to me with a bucket of money and offered all the resources they could, the first thing that I and probably many other clinicians believe would be an amazing asset to a rehabilitation facility is a space for creative expression. Anthony Store Solitude once said, the creative person is constantly seeking to discover himself, to remodel his own identity and to find meaning in the universe through what he creates. I believe creativity in all forms of art can enable self-expression. It is a language because sometimes we communicate in hand gestures, in cries, in silence, and sometimes we communicate in pictures or in ideas that aren't easy to put into words. Creativity is an opportunity to experiment. And most importantly, it is a source of connection and engagement. The act of creativity often becomes relational. A picture invites understanding and reflection. A word, poem or song invites people to listen. You put a set of pens or paints in the center of a group of people, invariably enough, people will begin to create together. I'm going to be honest with you, I, I completely wrote, rewrote my presentation a couple of different times, but after deeply looking further into what this particular Hopkins, our theme was, imagine, explore, experiment and engage, a creative mindset will help any of you listening today to potentially change certain practices into a framework that makes somebody's care and rehabilitation more personal and identifiable to them and will have whole life outcomes, which is what we should all strive for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, it's very, um, very inspirational and um, and it sparked some 
ideas with me which have been sort of simmering away for quite a long time about the necessity for creativity and um, and uh, a way to express things beyond the intellectual and beyond the um, beyond just what we can through language because I think that's a very limiting that that can be a very limiting um, framework so um, thank you indeed um, so I actually let me just have a little look in the questions um, it's just coming up so I've actually got a brief question for Tim, Karen and Sue. Um, I find that one of the biggest difficulties that people seem to have is um, finding new directions that are consistent with their identity. So the the imagine phase, and this is particularly the case when people are, um, you know, depressed and confused after um, some kind of um, quite traumatic injury sometimes or have been living with pain for a very long period of time. Do you have any tips? So this is the imagine phase of imagine, explore, experiment, engage. So do you have any tips for that imagine phase for helping people with that? Might get you. Can Sue and Karen, can you unmute yourselves? I think probably um, one of the things that we find through the STEPS program, um, and I think several people talk about this, is just giving it a go, um, even if it's not maybe where you want to go. Um, and I think some people talk about putting their big girl and boy undies on and just going out into the community and trying it. And I guess the benefits of doing that in a group program like we have can sometimes be really beneficial. I think Tim um, nicely points out that just having that peer support of someone there walking alongside you is actually the, the best part um, of helping to get back out into the community. But I'll defer to Tim's expertise. He may have something more to add. <laughs> oh, well, I was probably going to say a similar thing along the lines of it is probably a lot easier for us to have uh, certain conversations because we have similar lived experiences. Um, so um, as a peer support team, we've learnt to be able to reflect on our own journeys. But we're also of the understanding, though, that that our own journeys is not like other people's. And, and um, so we, we never try to actually understand what someone is going through. Um, I think one of the things that, that we do well as a peer support team is by being present there, um, and we're very blessed that we can be in on the unit and on the ground every day of the week, um, we, we are able to subliminally inject ourselves into um, certain moments of people's um, rehabilitation and clinical moments so it might be that they someone is on the on the plinth doing some physio and we might just pull up beside them and you know we can um, spark up a conversation with them and and realize that they may have been having a pretty down and flat day um, and we just we just start conversations we check in with how they are we show a lot of empathy um, to help build up trust first I think that's probably the most important thing is building up a trust that then allows the people uh, that we are um, helping uh, to uh, to open up to us about who they who they are and and what they're feeling and what they want to do in the future. So I, th I think we're very blessed that we get the opportunity to do that on a day to day basis. And I would say it's really important to to create the trust first um, uh, and just by treating them as people, not patients, or you are numbers. <laughs> Absolutely, I think, and I think talking with someone is completely different than talking at someone. So that's the biggest thing I, I've i noticed is having the ability to talk with people and engage. This feeling, this feeling of 
valuing people as people and making them feel supported is brings up the idea of safety for me, the safety to step into the unknown, the safety to actually try something out, even though it might be completely new to you and maybe something that you can't really imagine because it's it's beyond beyond your experience. So I think, you know, what you were saying, so about just getting out there and trying something, even if it's not exactly perfect is is probably probably relevant and then you can you can start to refine things from there i think watching and being involved and and watching someone be brave gives others around them the courage to be brave and that in itself is really powerful moments when you see that happen yeah, we've got one more question here about, um, I think this is for you, Sue. How did you navigate a group-based and statewide program during the pandemic? Um, with a lot of difficulty. <laughs> um, one of the things that I guess we tried to pivot and do things online, there was lots of challenges with that. Um, obviously, trying to educate a whole group of people around the state to um, learn to use technology like we're using now uh, the first thing was I had to learn to use it myself which was a, a challenge in itself but I think some of the learnings that have come from that we're actually now able to offer um, online groups for people who live remotely or regionally where they have access and capability to join us which is great so I think that's some of the positive things that have come from um, not being able to connect physically yeah, I think I think there really are positive things that have come come from it, and um, I think those those sort of things are being worked into a lot of our a lot of our ways of engaging with people. Um, we might have to sort of start wrapping things up around now because um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I, um, I'm really thankful that you've made the time. Uh, an hour out of a busy day is, is, is a long time, um, and I hope you found it um, really valuable. Um, uh, we would encourage you to get in touch with um, the presenters today if you've got any further questions, and um, they can be um, contacted through Hopkins Centre at griffith.edu.au um, and um, you can also request um, documents um, from today's session from from that website um, which is now on the on the screen um, yeah and thank you so much to our um, presenters for from today um, um, it's been it's been really really valuable to me um, to you know I've got a I've got a framework around this but you guys have been living this for a, a, a number of years a really good number of years so um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise um, and I hope we go forwards um, and manage to get a whole lot a whole lot more people integrated into meaningful activity in their communities. All right, we'll see you next time at um, the next Hopkins Hour.